Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you on this Friday. I hope you had a wonderful week, and I hope that you have some fun weekend plans coming up. Uh, Some of my weekend plans fell through, and others got uh, scheduled. So my Saturday plans fell through, and then now I have plans on Sunday. We are going to be celebrating Risa's birthday. Risa from the last episode, yes. So I am recording once again uh, from Big Bear, Giant Bear Studios, excuse me, get my own studio name right, Giant Bear Studios. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back two episodes to episode 298 and you can find out all about (laughs) Giant Bear Studios. So I am recording once again with the giant bear Chaco he's hanging out with me and we're doing a little recording also this is my 300th episode I cannot believe I have done 300 episodes of a book review podcast that is just amazing to me and you know some whenever anyone asks me how long I've done a podcast I'm like oh you know a couple years and then I realize that no it's four maybe almost five So I've been doing this for a while, and thank you for being a part of this journey with me, because wouldn't be here without all of you and without the fabulous authors that I get to interview. And today I'm speaking with yet another fabulous author. I think I mentioned at the end of the last episode that I am speaking today with author Mia P. Menensala about her book, Arsenic and Adobo. It is the first in a series of cozy mysteries. And the description is as follows. When Lila Macabagal, I'm sure I said that wrong, Mia will say it in the interview and she will get it, get the pronunciation right, my apologies. When Lila moves back home to recover from a horrible breakup, her life seems to be following all the typical rom-com tropes. She's tasked with saving her Tita Rosie's failing restaurant, and she has to deal with a group of matchmaking aunties who shower her with love and judgment. But when a notoriously nasty food critic, who happens to be her ex-boyfriend, drops dead moments after a confrontation with Lila, her life quickly swerves from a Nora Ephron romp to an Agatha Christie case. With the cops treating her like she's the one and only suspect, and the shady landlord looking to finally kick the Megapagal family out and resell the storefront, Lila is left with no choice but to conduct her own investigation. Armed with the nosy auntie network, her barista best bud, and her trusted dashing Longasina, Lila takes on this tasty, twisted case and soon, find, soon finds her own neck on the chopping block. So that is the description of Arsenic and Adobo. It is, again, the first in a new cozy series, um, a Tito Rosie's Kitchen Mystery. I really love cozy mysteries I've discovered in the last few years, and this one is no exception. I love the lighthearted nature of a cozy mystery, and I love all of the all of the different elements that go into making a cozy mystery. You know, there's usually a, a pet. In this case, there's a dog, and there are always a cast of really fun secondary characters that make appearances But what I really like about this cozy mystery and this series is that the main character is Filipino. And so I got to learn a lot about Filipino culture and cuisine that I didn't know before. I really want to try a bunch of the things that are made in the book because I've heard of some of them, but I've never tried any of them. And of course, there are recipes and, you know, whenever there's a a book with food in it. I, I always want to try it. I want. I just want to 
taste what I'm reading about. So I'm excited to hopefully one of these days try some new cuisine. But I also love that element that I, I got to learn a little bit more about Filipino culture through Lila and her family. And her family is extended and awesome and hilarious. And the aunties are those kinds of aunties that aren't necessarily blood related, but they're, they're still your aunties and you still better listen to them. <laughs> she also has a best friend who is Pakistani and who happens to be a member of the LGBT community. So uh, there's representation there. I just love all the different elements that you don't always see in every book that you pick up. So as you know, I'm a big fan of representation in what I'm reading and I'm very grateful to Mia for including various elements of representation and not in a forced way just in a way that seems natural and fits in with the story uh, so I thank her for that I also thank her for again teaching me about Filipino food Filipino culture and and showing me the ways in which food and culture and family is the same and and also different from some of the relationships that I have and some of my, some of my family traditions, etc. There's always common ground that you can find, even if the food does seem unusual, not unusual, unfamiliar at first. So anyway, really fun story. Very glad to have found another cozy series. Let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Mia so she can tell you more about the book and the series. Hi, Mia. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, right, thanks for having me, Sarah. I'm excited to have you here to talk about your new cozy mystery, Arsenic and Adobo. Before we get to the book, though, if you could share a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. So my name is Mia P. Manansala, uh, she, her, and I am a certified book coach, author, and currently library worker from the Chicagoland area. Um, and this is my debut novel. I've been at it as, uh, trying to make it as a mystery writer for about five or six years now and I'm just so excited that people are out there reading my book and it has um, fairly positive <laughs> fairly positive reviews a pretty decent reception definitely better than I expected wonderful yeah it should get it's a lot of fun so uh, I will hope <laughs> good reviews thank you for your pronouns I appreciate that um, mm -hmm. tell me about what library you work in Sure. I work at the Forest Park Public Library, which is a suburb of Chicago. Okay. I'm just nosy because my dad's a retired librarian. So <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> where, people, where people work. So, um, again, the book is Arsenic and Adobo. Can you give an overview of the premise? Sure. So, as you mentioned before, it's a cozy mystery. And for any listeners who are not familiar with that subgenre, um, I like to tell people that cozies are like the hallmark of murder mysteries. You know, they are, um, there is no graphic sex, violence, or, or bad language, shall we say, on the page. Um, I literally wrote a book that my mother could read because um, she is the one who got me into this genre. It's her favorite genre. We both really love these um, these kinds of books, but I haven't really seen a lot of books that reflected my experience, so I basically wrote what I always wanted to read, which is a um, younger Filipino-American protagonist um, solving a murder mystery that involves her family. So Lila Macapagal is a young Filipino-American woman who left her small town thinking she was going to make it big in Chicago, um, but due to some poor relationship choices, shall we say, she has to move back home and is tasked with saving her aunt's failing restaurant. And while there, her she reconnects with her high school sweetheart, but instead of it being like a really cute, like second chance at love story, he has become the town's vindictive food critic and has been trying to get her aunt's restaurant shut down like on the regular. And, you know, to make matters worse, one day while he's there eating their food, mid-meal, mid-review, he passes out and dies. And Lila becomes the main suspect in his murder. Yeah, definitely um, not your normal hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting a reunion. <laughs> yeah, uh, hallmark with dead bodies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hallmark mystery. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that the main character and her family, of course, are Filipino-American. It's um, not uh, a culture that I'm as familiar with, so it's really fun to 
get to read with the interactions and including the food is, is food a big part of your life Oh, yeah. It's, you know, I always tell people like food is like my favorite thing in the world. Like, sorry to my husband and dogs, but, <laughs> and also, um, I mean, I feel like food can stand for, like, as, as, as a writer, you know, like food stands in for so many things. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Chicago. So it's, it's, it's like this one tangible connection I have to, to like my, my homeland. So my background, um, in the book, I, I often use food to show it as a love language, how people who maybe are not so able to openly like say I love you or show affection, uh, physical affection, show it through the care that they give and, and the food that they try to feed you and things like that, um, which is definitely a thing in my family. It's a thing in my family, too, actually. My grandmother uh, was Norwegian, and that is how she showed her love. When she died, All 90% of the stories we talked about involved food. <laughs> so <laughs> I totally understand. Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. I have absolutely no idea what I was choking on there when I was laughing in that last answer. And uh, it could have been, I don't know, it could have been air. It could have been my own spit. Who knows? just the the joy of being me you choke on weird things anyway let's uh let's take that break and when we come back Mia will be talking about her inspiration for this story and this series so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me and it is amazing in that it is a three in one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer, it is a volumizer, it is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam waves. The bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R.com and search dryer brush. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Mia P. Manansala about her new cozy series, the Tita Rosie's Kitchen series. And the first book in that series is called Arsenic and Adobo. So let's go ahead and return now to the podcast and the interview. Um, what was your initial inspiration for this story? Um. I would so it was kind of like a two-parter. The the reason I, I like to say I you know I like to preface it by saying like oh cozies are like you know, are like Hallmark movies is because uh, my mentor Kelly Garrett who's another fantastic um, amateur sleuth writer, um, really hilarious. We were just kind of chatting one day about like some of the cozies we had been reading lately, and we were like man like these contemporary cozies again at least the ones that we were reading kind of had like a lot of similarities to rom-com premises. 
Um, so like the entire first page of Arsenic and Adobo was me kind of playing with those tropes, right? Like a lot of times, both cozies and rom-coms, it's almost always a woman, usually from a small town, right? May, um, very often she leaves that town to strike out on her own and is forced to return, you know, whether it's because of like, you know, poor business decisions, uh, an ailing family member, you know, saving the family business, you know, something like that makes her return to her small town. And she has to kind of like integrate herself back into that life and kind of like figure out who she is, what she wants and kind of fall in love all over again, if not romantically, then with the town and the people there and the life that she now has. Um, and so I kind of like embraced it. So that was one of it, just the idea of like, oh, cozy are just rom-coms with dead bodies. I could have fun with that, <laughs> you know? Um, and then the second thing, shortly after that conversation, I was on the train um, on the way to like my, my previous job. So before the pandemic, I worked as an English language instructor in downtown Chicago. So I was on the train to work and the first line popped into my head, fully formed. Um, so it was, um, my name is Lila Makapagal and my life has become a rom-com cliche. So like people ask me like, oh, why? Like, like my mom asked me like, oh, why did you, why'd you choose the name Lila Mak uh, you know, Lila Makapagal? Like what's the significance? And I was like, I don't know. She named herself. <laughs> 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 um, and with that first line, I knew, I'm like, okay, that's a character, that's a story, let's kind of see where this goes. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that first page, because when I was reading it, I was at my sister's house, and I, I read the first, the, the first page, and I think the first two pages to my sister and my 15-year-old niece, because it was cracking me up with the, uh, the Hallmark and the rom-com comparison. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> They were enjoying it as well, so um, they, they love to watch Hallmark and Hallmark Mystery. So you mentioned Kelly Garrett. I uh, love her mm -hmm. podcast as well. I love her um, her Hollywood series. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about Lila. Can you um, talk about her as the main character and, and what about her might resonate with readers? Sure. So... As I said before, Lila Makabal, she's a, uh, she's a 25 year old uh, Filipino American woman who was born and raised in the mid a small town in the Midwest, and she kind of has like big fish in a small pond syndrome, I guess you can say. Um, and the reason, like, I purposely chose her to be that age, like you know, considerably younger than myself, because I feel like 25 is that perfect age where she is young enough that she thinks she knows everything, that she thinks she kind of has it all figured out. She knows what's best for herself. But at the same time, she has so much to learn, both about herself and the world and what it is that she thinks that she really wants. Um, and so because I, I, you know, I went to this knowing it's a series, right? Cozies are always series. Like maybe they're not long running. Maybe you only get two books. Um, Berkeley, I, I, uh, my publisher, I currently have a three book deal with them. So at the very least, I know, you know, Lila is going to be in three books in this series. So I had to make sure it's a character with enough depth, but enough possibility for growth to sustain that. Because, you know, even though each book is meant to be read as a standalone, like you could pick up like book three and never read the other two and you'll understand everything. Mm -hmm. Um I still think it's important that the, the character doesn't stay stagnant, that she grows at least a little bit in every single book in different ways, tackling um, different issues she has. Yes. Um, and so I feel like people, you know, could latch on to that. So like with the younger readers, you know, being able to see, you know, like, even though I said that she's considerably, I'm still a millennial, like she is like, I'm at the older end of millennial, she's at the younger end of millennial. And so I feel like we, people in that age range will understand that particular struggle where like you're an adult technically, <laughs> but like, are you an adult? I still can't think of myself as an adult and I turned 35 this year. I have a mortgage. I'm, you know, I have a career and I'm still like, am I an adult? I don't know. I don't like making these kinds of choices, Ugh, you know? And I feel like she's very much at the beginning of that where she, she desperately wants people to take her seriously. Right. She, she 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 knows she's an adult, but at the same time, she is still so unsure of the path that she has to take. And you know, I feel like that's something that anyone really can kind of understand that 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 weird like I 
believe in myself so much, but at the same time, what the heck am I doing? It's, 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 it's so hard when it's two completely different sides of the coin, but I feel like I feel that every day. And so does she. Um, but like, we're not like totally the same, you know, like we both grew up in like multi-generational households. So the importance of family is something I stress a lot, but like I was, I'm the oldest child, you know, in an immigrant family. So for me, there was a lot of responsibility placed on me. And I feel like I, you know, kind of went with it. Like I accepted it. I, 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 I knew that was my position in life and I was fine with it. But I feel like with her, especially as an only child uh, and, and as of a younger generation who expects different things from life, she really resents some of the pressures that are put on her. So even though we kind of have very similar backgrounds, the way we view family and the choices that we make in life can be very, very different. Mm-hmm. Well, right, just, I didn't just, I didn't, I didn't just want to stand in for me. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh no, that's okay. I was just gonna say <laughs> that that young age where she's she, she's an adult, but she doesn't, you know, she has a lot to learn. But she's also just had to move back home, and so she's living again. Her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so I, that that's another level and layer to her character, which I've been mm-hmm. there. I understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. I also like her best friend character, uh, the character of her best friend, Adina, because mm-hmm. she is um, she's not Filipino. She is Pakistani. Is that correct? I yes. Right. Okay, Pakistani. She's vegan. She's a lesbian. I mean, she's not necessarily your typical best friend character. Mm-hmm. So. I like that there was representation on multiple levels with both of these mm-hmm. characters. Yeah, and with, you know, Adina was just so much fun to write. And, um, you know, people ask me about, like, like how I cho- like how I chose the characters in this town. And really, I populated it with people, like, with the people I saw around me, the people in my life, you know, like, my close friend group. Like, <laughs> I even said in the acknowledgments, like, the, like um, so her best friend's name is Adina Awan. Awan is... Um, the last name of two of my very dear friends. And so, like, I basically just stole their last name to slot into the book. I was like, you guys are going to live on in my book, you know? And they're like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> you know, so so I was able to ask them questions about things that I wasn't sure about. Um, and her character is just, it's, she was so much, I had to actually pull back a lot because she's such a strong character that she could easily take over the scene, you know? And I had an entire subplot for her and I had all this backstory planned. And then I was like, wait, this is Lila's story. So even as fun as Adina is, I had to pull her back a bit to make her more of just like a foil as opposed to, you know, the same amount of screen time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she could easily have her own story. <laughs> when it comes to your characters, what kinds of character development do you like to do before writing or do you prefer that it, that development evolves as you write? I do a little bit of both, honestly. So I am a bit of a plotter. And again, a plotter means like I I plan out the story ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Not everything, but especially now that I, I have to write on a deadline, <laughs> you know, and it's in a series and it has to be approved by my editors ahead of time. You know, I know all the major beats of the story ahead of time, which means I have to know like the general characters who populate it ahead of time before I start writing. And um, I'll, I'll do some like kind of like bare bones work in the beginning. And then as I'm writing, I'll fill them in. But I've been wrong more than once about who I thought a character was. So sometimes I'll kind of stop and then I'll do um, some kind of free writing. And, and, and it, what I do character work wise depends on like, the particular problem I'm having. Like if I feel like I don't know enough about a character to see how they would actually um, behave in certain situations, I will do a deep dive into their backstory, which I don't put on the page, but I know it's in my head. So for me, it makes sense why they would choose A instead of B or anything like that. Just like deep, deep backstory. Some, I feel like, you know, particularly when it comes to dialogue, you know, it's hard to make everyone sound distinct. And if I, I feel like the way I'm writing this character, they don't sound like a person, right? They just sound like whatever I need them to be. So sometimes I'll do like a journal entry from their point of view, even though like it's a first person Lila, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll open up a new document and I'll write from the perspective of like, um, you know, Jay or Adina or, or Amir, or someone that I know I need to kind of nail their perspective and make them sound distinct. 
you know, I'll do a journal entry just so I can get in their head, figure out what their speech patterns would be like, figure out what they want, you know, things like that. So it, it really varies character to character, story to story. Sometimes some stories are a little bit harder and I have to stop more often because, you know, just because I think the story is supposed to go one way, just because I think a character is one particular way, I'll start actually writing and be like, oh, I was wrong. I guess I have to, <laughs> I guess it needs a little bit more work. I have to swerve this way now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our second break of the podcast. When we return, Mia will be talking about some of the research that she did for this book. And as you can imagine, since the, uh, the person that's murdered is murdered by arsenic, there was some poison research. <laughs> so stay tuned and we'll, we'll hear more about that. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Mia P. Manansala. Let's return to that interview. And then what type of research did you do for this book? Oh, uh, yeah. So with this one, I feel like I joke around a lot. Like I have to be on some kind of like FBI watch list because I did <laughs> so much like just poison research. Um, <laughs> you and so many other authors. <laughs> I know, I know. It's one of those, like, I'm a writer, I swear. <laughs> um, because, I mean, like, I knew for the first book, at least, because, like, again, because cozies can't be graphic in any way, I was like, okay, what are some, you know, ways that are not too too violent seeming, at least for the first book, to, to include? And because it was in a restaurant, I'm like, well, of course, poisoning is going to have to be the way to go. You know, like, him getting, like, stabbed outside the restaurant is not really going to have the same effect you know, bringing that some kind of tension regarding her and her family's restaurant is, you know, is if he's eating the, the restaurant's food and gets poisoned. So I knew that was like my murder weapon, but I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I had like, I had to like, I didn't even know which poison would be. So I just had to go into a deep dive about which poisons I think would be interesting or, or the right ones to use in a story. Um, How do you and, even... I mean, what, 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 I, I'm just wondering how you even start Googling that. What kinds of yeah. points are there? What yeah. kind of, like, I'm not even sure where to start. But well, luckily, a few years ago, I can't even remember when, I went to this mystery convention called Malice Domestic, which kind of specializes in traditional mystery. And one of their most popular presenters, and she's popular for a reason, is someone called the Poison Lady. Ah. And, and, <laughs> right. And this, and I, cause I think she's, I think she's a nurse with like years, like just many years of experience. So she can, she speaks very knowledgeably on the, on the topic. And this was, this was way before I started writing Arsenic and Adobe. It might've been before, like, cause Arsenic and Adobe was the second novel I finished, but the first one I sold. So, you know, it was like early, early in my writing career. Um, but it sounded really interesting. And so, and her talk was fast. Like I just scribbled down so many notes um about all these different types of poisons where they could find them you know the symptoms etc and so like when i knew poison was the way to go i was luckily i, I held on to that notebook and i was able to kind of like page through it and so like that kind of guided me i was like okay i have this notebook full of notes 
but I need a little bit more than this, right? Because it was it was like a one hour talk. That was you know clearly not enough. So I kind of chose a few that seemed like they would be workable, and then and then I googled from there. Okay, <laughs> I love it. And I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Were there other types of research that you did? Oh yeah, no. Um, I'm trying to think. Let me see. What else did I do? Because I mean, oh, there was one part I always like to talk about because it's just like, wow, the things that you overlook because you're doing a deep dive into something so random that you forget the very obvious. So, again, in my acknowledgments, there are two of my beta readers that I personally thank from saving me from a very, like, embarrassing mistake. So when I was halfway through the first draft, like, you know, before, again, before I had, before I had sold it or anything, I wrote about half the book cleaned it up a little bit and then sent it to beta readers. So I was like, do you think this is going anywhere? Like, you know, should I, should I finish it? You know, is it worth the rest of my time? And one of them was a retired lawyer. And one of them is in the medical field, a pathologist. And both of them are also mystery writers. And both of them like emailed me back practically screaming, like she can't do about a particular thing. Like she can't do this. This is so illegal. It violates HIPAA like in so many ways. And I was just like, oh, right. Patient confidentiality, you know, like something yeah. so basic that should have been common sense slipped my mind because I was so into the idea of like the investigation and how does this amateur student get this information? And, you know, it's, it's not really a spoiler, you know, but like one of Lila's, you know, her, her cousin Bernadette is a nurse. So in my mind, I was like, that's perfect. She's a nurse. She could just go ask for information. Um, and that's what she did in the, in, in the original draft of the story. And they called me out on it. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that's right. But then also it made me realize, oh, that's just really lazy writing. Like, oh, she happens to be related to someone who has information. She <laughs> asked for it and receives it. Like that's, you know, it, it's almost too too easy for a story like this. Mm -hmm. So I was actually really grateful because it made me get creative. Like, okay, well, she still wants or needs information. What are some ways she can get it? Um, what are the alternatives? How can she work past this obstacle? So like that was great. And I was like, okay. And I <laughs> I had to do, you know, a little bit more Googling with that. Um, I'll think a little bit about like things about like bail and jail time and things like that. Like I, you know, I didn't know anything like that. I, it was a lot of like, well, how much can I stretch in fiction? <laughs> and certain lawyers are like, not that much. And I had to, so I had to kind of redo a few things. Um, you know, uh, any mistakes are all on my own. Like my beta readers were amazing. So like, you know, it's definitely not their fault. Any mistakes that are still in there are on me. Um, but I had to do a lot of like things like that. Like, you know, the more medical side, the more legal side. Um, I also had to do certain things on just like, what are restaurants, um, like a health inspector, like what would they be looking for? in mm -hmm. the state of Illinois, you know, what would be considered like an offense or something like that? Or what would happen if someone actually like died in a restaurant? Does it get, you know, so again, some things I stretched for the sake of the story and other things I tried to, you know, adhere as much as possible to the truth of the matter. And, you know, and parts of it, I'm like, well, it's a fictional town. We can just say it's different there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about this, but, uh, do you, th what, what other kinds of autobiographical elements do you include in your writing? Um, well, I would say, like, definitely, you know, like, the Lola Flora character, uh, Lola meaning grandmother, parts of her, the, again, the extreme parts of her personality are based on the more extreme parts of my grandmother's personality. So, like I said earlier, I grew up in a multi-generational household. So, like, in my house, I grew up with, like, my maternal grandparents, parents, me, my brothers, cousins, you know, and other family members would kind of come and go because we were just like that, like the stable house where like if you were kind of like down on your luck and you needed a little time to, to kind of get back on your feet, like you could kind of stay with us for a little bit. So, we, mm -hmm. you know, we had the kind of that. Um, and so my grandmother definitely had an influence. Um, like the aunties, the calendar crew, they are like an amalgamation of like – the aunties I've met in my life and the auntie stories I've gotten from my friends. Um, sure. So some of the things <laughs> that they say have definitely been said to me. If they weren't said to me, they were said to a good friend of mine. Um, and so 
again, it's not, you know, you, you're not going to point at anyone and be like, oh, that's, that's definitely, you know, X. It's like, no, it's that part is X, but this part is this and this part, you know, so I kind of mix them all together. So they're not, you know, a stand in again for one, one person in my life. Right. All right. And then um, what draws you particularly to writing cozy mysteries? I mean, you said it's your mom's favorite genre and that you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that draws you to this particular genre? I just, I think there is great value in books that are just fun and entertaining. Um, especially now when things are so hard and people are looking for escape, you know, like escape media. And I think particularly important for writers and, and characters from like historically excluded backgrounds, right? Because a lot of times, not always, of course, but again, a lot of times when um, a person of color is writing characters that are of color as well, for them to be taken seriously or for them to be take, have, or, you know, to receive decent events, they have to be about like the struggle or trauma or, mm -hmm. you know, like if we're, if we're going to be, you know, if, if you're an Asian American, you, you're writing about like the immigrant experience or something like that, which those are all fine. Those are all extremely important and many are very beautifully written. But I think that, as readers, we deserve to see ourselves in like a wide spectrum of media, right? We can have the tear jerkers, we can have the comedies, we can have sci-fi, we can have romance, you know. I think it's important that we be allowed to see ourselves in everything. Yeah. Um, so for me, you know, people are like, oh, why didn't you write something more like hard hitting? Why didn't you write something more serious, you know, like in quotes? And I'm like, because, I think we deserve to have fun too. You know, I, we deserve to kind of, you know, be the heroes of our stories, solve the case, find love, do all those things. Well, and yes, the, the struggle and, and those things are important and they are part of people's experiences, but they're not the only part of people's experiences. You exactly. Know, happens too. So, mm -hmm. um, makes yeah. To me. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to write a character where, you know, yes, she's Filipino American like me, and that's very important. And it shapes how she sees the world. It shapes how the world sees her, more importantly. But at the same time, she gets to just be. She gets to just exist as a person. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's, it's not her entirety of who she is. Right. And for readers like myself who aren't Filipino, uh, I get to, I get to immerse myself in that culture in just uh, an everyday family kind of situation, you know, it, it, it still educates me on a different culture, but without, you know, it, it's a different kind of education. I can read the other kinds of books as well and learn more about the history and the struggles, but it's, it's mm -hmm. fun as a reader to just be able to see an everyday family. Mm -hmm. So um, what are you working on now? Are you working on the second or the third book of this series? <laughs> Technically both. Um, so nice. the fun thing that I learned when you become a writer is that you juggle many things at the same time and wear a bunch of hats. So like right now, you know, with this interview, like I'm promoing book one because it just came out in May. I turned in my edits, my first round of edits for book two last week, two weeks ago. And I'm currently drafting book three. So like I told you before the call, I need the writing time. It's because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to develop book three. So I'm, I'm, I'm in early stages on that. So <laughs> everything at once. <laughs> and I also have idea for a new series. It's kind of like, like percolating in the back of my head. You know, obviously the stuff on deadline gets first pass, but like I'm letting it grow and simmer and see if I can really make it something. Cause it's an idea I'm really excited about. And it, it would also be like another like Filipino cozy idea, but I can't say too much because right. I don't have much there yet. <laughs> Just in the simmering stages, I understand. Yes. Final break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about the dog in the series. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Mia P. Manansala, and I mentioned before the break that we would be talking about the dog in this series. I've probably mentioned somewhere on the podcast before that I've never, that growing up and, and well into my adult years, I was not a dog person. I was scared of dogs as a child, even the little ones. I just, I didn't like them. And then when I was older, I wasn't necessarily scared of them, but you know, they jump and they lick and they stick their noses places that aren't appropriate. And then my husband got two dogs, two little chihuahuas. And now I am just that total dork. Whenever I see a dog, I'm like, oh, puppy, and I have to, you know, I have to talk to it and scritch it. And I am just a sucker. Like this summer, I've been all over my brother because, no, he's, he's, he's a fine dog owner, but I've been teasing him all summer about how he doesn't love his dog. And if he loved his dog, he would bring his dog for, to me to play with. And who am I? <laughs> Even when that dog, who's now 14, she's very old and very sweet. Even when she was a puppy, I didn't like her. And now suddenly, not suddenly, in the last five years, eight years, something along that, I, I'm that dog person. At any rate, let's return to the interview so we can talk about the dog in the books and not my weird dog evolution in life. One other question about this series. Um, cozy mysteries often have a, an animal, and, and yours does. Uh, <laughs> is, the, is the dog based on any of your pets? No, I have several. Uh, I have, um, well, I currently have two dogs. Sadly, my, my old lady dog, you know, passed uh, like the week of my debut. I mean, talk about some highs and lows. Um, but no, the dogs are very different. I just, it was one of those things where I love dogs. I currently have two. I knew, you know, the adorable pet sidekick was, you know, a typical trope in cozies. And because it's a food, a food cozy and because we love puns, I was like, how <laughs> cute would it be for her to have a dachshund, a little wiener dog named Longanisa, which is a Filipino <laughs> sausage, you know? I was just like, oh, like the cuteness kills me. I was like, I know, like, I love that kind of like cheesy punness. Like the titles of cozies are, are one of my favorite things. I'm sad, like it's kind of hard to pun with Filipino food. So I had to go for the, like the alliterative route mm -hmm. instead of the pun route. But, um, but yeah, Longanisa is adorable surprisingly a fan fave <laughs> considering you know how little screen time she has yeah. i've had several people write to me asking like i want to see more longanisa in book two and i'm like okay fine there'll be more longanisa in book two she has a very pivotal role uh in book two <laughs> she's gonna have to have her own social media <laughs> <laughs> i mean like i you know to be fair, I'm sure, like, if I were to start, like, an Instagram for my pets, they would be so much more popular than, like, my personal Instagram or, like, you know, my author Instagram. So, I'm like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> um, is writing something that you have always wanted to do? How did you come to this place where now you're you're publishing? I mean, I think... You know, like a lot of writers, it's I've always loved writing. I always knew it was something I wanted to do, but I don't think I that I ha I, I didn't have it in me to like take a a project to completion until like I was much older. Um, you know, because I started in elementary school. You know, I told people I wanted to be a writer then, um, and I kind of dabbled even all throughout high school, but I never really finished anything. You know, like I came up with characters, I came up with ideas and I even started a few stories, but I never, it never went anywhere. And I kind of stopped in college, um, even though I was an English major, but you know, that's academic writing, not creative writing. 
Um, and then after college, I went, I went to teach English abroad in South Korea and I was there for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I came back home and then after a while, I kind of realized I was in a rut. You know, I was like, you know, I was on the, like, you know, I had adventures all over the world and now here I am living at home again, hanging mm -hmm. out with the same people, doing the same thing. Do it. And I was just like, oh, wow. And at the time I was going to be turning 30 soon. I was like 28, 29, which again, like now that I'm 30, I'm like, oh, wow, that's nothing. Like 30 is awesome. But... <laughs> You know, at the time, I was just like, I'm not going to do anything in my life. And I remembered how much I loved writing. And I was like, you know what? Now is the time. Let me give this a shot. So I, I literally just Googled a writing class. I was like, writing class Chicago, because I'd never taken a creative writing class before. And I thought maybe, maybe like the structure of a class would force me to do something. Um, and I found a one-day writing workshop. It was a mystery writing workshop taught by Lori Rader Day, who's also amazing writer um and i was like oh because at the time i didn't think i was going to be a mystery writer even though it was like one of my favorite genres to read i kind of always thought i would write kid lit um particularly maybe like something more like fantasy based because those are the ones that kind of drew me when i was younger um but i was like okay mystery writing it's one day i can afford this just to, just to check it out and see if i like it and i haven't looked back since you know lori has been so so supportive I don't know what it was, but she, you know, that day she was, whatever I was, I wrote in class. She was like, I think you have something here. I think you're a mystery writer. Um, and she like invited me to join like mystery writers of America and sisters in crime. And she, you know, would email me like various opportunities. Um, and yeah, I just, I just kind of stuck with it because partly because of like the idea I came up with in that class and partly because of her persistence in let in, in letting me feel like I was welcome in the mystery writing community. Mm hmm um, you mentioned Kelly Garrett as your mentor. Did you do pitch wars? Yes, I did in 2017. Awesome. Um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Um, build the community and mm -hmm. do it early. Um, so as I said, you know, with Lori, you know, I because she she invited me to to join to to go to meetings for these organizations, and I was like, oh, you know, like what, like I'm, you know, not a writer is what I told you. Like I don't have, you know, I literally just came up with an idea in this class. I I don't have anything finished. I don't have anything close to finished. You know, I I don't I don't have anything. And she's like, no, like building your community and networking early is the best time to do it because writing is hard uh, and publishing is opaque. And so getting to know people um, at all various stages of their writing careers is like, is really, really helpful early on, right? Not, not in like, oh, like I can use them later, but like to help you understand both the industry and your own writing better. You know, because I joined that group, I was able to join a critique group and that critique group pushed me to do better and better and better. Cause I feel like, you know, outside eyes, um, the right outside eyes can be really helpful to to your growth as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it they gave you, you know, making writer friends, like you have cheerleaders, people who are there to support you and cheer you on when like you're ready to give up because <laughs> you're always ready to give up. Um, yeah. And yeah. also like most importantly, at least for me and some of the other people are, it's like, you know, people who are not industry, who don't write, don't, necessarily understand some of the the problems you're going through you know like they'll love you and they'll support you and they're like oh that's too bad but they don't really grasp either how how like amazing this is you know like me and my friends joked about like um one of us had gotten a starred review in, in one of the trade journals you know and and her husband was like oh just one star that's too bad honey but like i'm sure you'll do better next time and she's like no 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 like there is only one star. Like the star is like the best thing you can get. And he was like, oh, so it's good, I guess. <laughs> Congratulations. You know, and it's, and like, again, like they're, they're supportive, right? They're happy for you, but they don't quite get, <laughs> you know, certain aspects of like how, of how tough it can be. Like to the, how, like how big a deal it is to get that star or like how big a deal a certain rejection is. They're like, oh, that's so sad. Well, you'll do better next time. And it's just like, but that's not really like the point here, you know, so having someone who gets what you're going through 
mm-hmm. um, is, is just so immensely helpful. Yeah, I can imagine. When you take the time to read, uh, not for research or anything like that, but for yourself, what are your favorite authors and who are your favorite, um, sorry, what are your favorite genres and who are your favorite authors? Um, so, of course, I love a ton of, like, mystery and cozy, but, like, over the past year, I have been reading a ton of diverse romance. Like, I think I just need, like, the happiness. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, lately, like, some of my big faves, um, Sherry Thomas, her Lady Sherlock series is the best. I love it so much. And I've started reading her, because she also writes historical romance, so I've started reading those as well. Um Alyssa Cole, anything she writes. She has romance. She also came out with a thriller recently. Oh. Um, Talia Hibbert, um, her her Brown Sisters trilogy is amazing, and I've read a lot of her earlier back catalog, too, um, which is really, really just, just so much fun, but with so much heart. Um, I'm part of, like, a, we call ourselves, like, the Berkeleys, like, my fellow, like, Berkeley publishing debut authors, and I've been lucky enough to read a lot of um like arcs and things like that one of the best part of becoming a writer is like meeting other talented writer friends and getting getting like early access to their books mm-hmm. um so like on the mystery side um killer content by olivia black is, uh, is like another cozy mystery set in brooklyn set in williamsburg um the her sequel no memes of escape which takes place in a like it's, it's a murder in an escape room um, comes out in October, and I'm I'm reading it right now actually, and I'm like I'm like at 80. percent I was like, oh no, I have to I have to do this interview. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, Dead Dead Girls by Nikessa Afia is a 1920s um, black Harlem. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a serial killer out there uh, killing young black girls, and um, Louise Lloyd is basically kind of like coerced, shall we say, into helping the police um, find this killer since she can go to places that um, that the obviously all white male uh, police force can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so not a cozy. I need to state that. Like, because you'll look at the cover and you're like, oh, what a gorgeous cover. And it's illustrated. So like, maybe you think it's a, it's a serial killer. So like, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a great book, but don't go into it being like, I want a light, feel good story. Right. That's killer content. If you're like, I want like an immersive historical mystery, that's Dead Dead Girls. <laughs> I actually put that on my uh my T B R recently because of a that she had put that she put out and made me look up the book and I was like I, I think Kelly might have even retweeted it. I'm not sure but how it ended up on my on my feed, but it's it's now on my T B R so <laughs> But yeah, it's it's it, it's good. It's fun. It's again, that's another one where it's like it's the beginning of a series. It's we're you know she's working on book two. I'm so excited for book two. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, where can people find you um, on social media? Do you have a, a, a website? Can you give all that good information? Sure. So my website is it's my name. So www.miapmanansala.com. And I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Not Facebook that much, but it exists. I check it every once in a while, mostly Twitter and Instagram. Um, but it's all the same handle, at MPM, the writer. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mia, we've covered a lot of different topics today as we've chatted, but is there anything that we haven't talked about that you were hoping uh, to be able to bring up time together? Um, nothing. Answered. Oh, I guess maybe like cause we touched lightly on the food before, but um, again, for people who are not familiar, so with culinary cozies, it's very common that the books include recipes, and that is true of my book as well. So in the back are four Filipino or Filipino inspired recipes that I came up with and included in the book. So um, I just think it's another fun element for those of you who are really like, maybe you're not super into mystery, but you're really into foodie type stories. Like that's a really great way in, especially if you're not familiar with Filipino food and are interested in giving it a try. Um, I love it when people post pictures of like the, the rest of them trying my recipes or letting me know, you know, what they thought about it. So um, I just think that's a really fun thing to share. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your holiday weekend to talk <laughs> about uh, the, uh, Arsenic and Adobo, but also this, the, the series itself. Uh, I really appreciate your time. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much. I mean, it's also your holiday weekend, and you've also got a lot going on, so I appreciate you being willing to, to schedule me in. Thank you so much to Mia for not only taking the time out of her holiday weekend, as I mentioned, but also her patience because this summer has not gone to plan and I am very behind on getting episodes posted. Thank you to Mia for her patience. Thank you to you for your patience as I am working on getting these episodes out. I should probably at some point talk about why my summer is not going to plan. I've mentioned it. I, see, I can't even remember what I talk about at any rate. Maybe next episode I'll, I'll give you a more detailed description of what's going on with my summer. But for now, thank you to Mia. Thank you to my readers for always for joining me. If you are a fan of Cozy Mysteries, you should definitely check out Arsenic and Adobo. Or maybe you haven't read a Cozy Mystery and you want to start and you still have some summer vacation left and want a good summer read. Definitely check out Arsenic and Adobo. It's it's so fun and it's so great to, like I said, learn more about a culture that I wasn't as familiar with, learn about some food that I haven't eaten, and just go along for a really fun ride with, of course, a cute dog to boot. So thank you to Mia and you should definitely check out the book. Speaking of books and authors, uh, of course, I've got another interview coming up, so I hope you'll join me for the next episode when I'll be speaking with author Carter Wilson. We are going to be discussing his new book, The Dead Husband. It is also a mystery, but definitely not a cozy mystery. It's more along the thriller and suspense lines. So check out that interview again. That's Carter Wilson, and the book is The Dead Husband. It's way too easy to make comments, weird comments with that book, because when I received it, I emailed the publicist to say, hey, I got the dead husband in the mail. Yeah, that's not going to flag me on any weird watch lists. So if you are a fan of this podcast, as always, I would ask you to write a review or give us a starred review, whichever is more comfortable to you on whatever platform that you listen to this podcast on. That really helps us to get the podcast out into the world to more listeners. So if you are able and willing to do that, I would greatly appreciate it. Also, follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, GSMC Book Review, you can find us there. So follow the podcast on social media and tell me, you know, ask questions, tell me what you're reading, interact with me. I love to hear from listeners. Hope you're having a great Friday. Like I said, I hope that your weekend goes really well. And whatever that weekend involves, I hope it also involves plenty of time to get lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can and also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. <laughs>